Right? So when we look at other strands of Christianity in America, mainstream Christianity, I would argue that African American Christianity as it developed is apart from that. There's something different. There's something that sets it apart from that. And really what sets it apart is that it really developed in much the same conditions as the early church. Well, hey everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity, a place where we seek to bring simplicity out of theological and historical complexity. And that is what we're doing today. Today was so much fun. Like I, I just finished the interview, I'm beaming. I love getting to do what I do. And today that joy came from a conversation with Father Paul Abernathy, an Orthodox uh, Christian priest who is doing fantastic work in Pittsburgh. He's looking at the intersection of African-American spirituality and the Orthodox Church, seeing many of the impulses of African-American spirituality fulfilled in the Orthodox Church. That's what he's experienced personally in his life. That's what he's writing about. And that's what he's hoping to help others experience as well, as well as doing incredible work in the neighborhoods around him, especially in historically underserved neighborhoods. And you can check out his nonprofit. It's a Christ, uh, Orthodox Christian nonprofit that seeks to go into uh, underserved neighborhoods and help them out at Neighborhood Resilience Project. I'm just so honored to even get to shed light on what he's doing. So if this interests you, and I'm sure it will if you jump into it, uh, please be sure to enjoy the interview. But before you do that, I wanna say thank you to my patrons who make these interviews possible. You may notice that I'm in a new setting. This is my new apartment. That's why we've been a little delayed. I was busy getting married, moving, starting a new job, blah, blah, blah. You've heard it all, right? But my patrons allow me to have the setup for these lights, to be able to record these interviews, to take the time out of my day to do all of that. So if you appreciate these, you want to see this channel keep going and growing, be sure to go to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity. That being said, here's the interview. Well, today I am joined by Father Paul Abernathy. Father Paul Abernathy is an African-American Orthodox Christian priest and founding pastor of St. Moses the Black Orthodox Church in the Hill District, a predominantly black neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He is the founder and CEO of the Neighborhood Resilience Project, an Orthodox Christian nonprofit focusing on building resilient, healing, and healthy communities through trauma-informed community development. He is a nationally renowned speaker whose work has been featured on local, national, and international television. Father Paul is a U.S. Army Iraq War veteran and holds master's degrees from the University of Pittsburgh and St. Tikhon's Orthodox Theological Seminary. He and his beloved wife, Christina, have two beautiful children. He is also the author of the recent book, Prayer of a Broken Heart, an Orthodox Christian Reflection on African-American Spirituality, which we'll be discussing today. Father Paul, thank you so much for joining me today. Austin, thank you so much for having me. Oh, well, it was truly my pleasure. And, you know, I'm fascinated by this book, the, the backstory of this. And I don't even know if I mentioned this in our emails was I was talking with one of the lovely people at Ancient Faith and they were kind of pitching an interview for another book. Um, and it was a great book. And I decided to kind of just scroll through some of their offerings. And I saw this title and was just so immensely intrigued because it seemed like such an interesting topic and one that I hadn't seen talked about much in Orthodox circles, like this intersection of African-American spirituality and the Orthodox Church. It wasn't two things that I would have thought to put together, but then when it was put together, it just, I, I, I was too intrigued to not follow up. Um, so I had a lot of fun reading your book and I'm really excited to be doing this. So to start with, like what, what inspired this book? Well, when uh, I myself am a convert to the Orthodox Church, and when I came into the Orthodox Church, I had this, I, I certainly had this profound encounter with the living God in the divine liturgy. I knew I was home <clears throat> when I was in the divine services of the Orthodox Church. And when I came into the church, I had this, this suspicion that was not related to uh, any sort of, uh, any perspective that someone had shared with me, but this suspicion that I would have to really put my African-American heritage in the past, perhaps seemed so different. But as I began to continue in my life and my journey as an Orthodox Christian, I encountered uh, other African American Orthodox Christians, namely in the Fellowship of St. Moses the Black, who really introduced to me the African American spiritual experience in the context of the Orthodox Church. And when I engaged in that conversation, 
I realized that what was my spiritual heritage as an African American was really fulfilled in the Orthodox Church, that it wasn't a contradiction, but rather it was a fulfillment. And <clears throat> it intrigued me to do my own explorations, research. I wanted to look at firsthand accounts. I wanted to, uh, people often talk about slavery <clears throat> as though they uh, perhaps are some, have some kind of expertise on the topic, but I wanted to, 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 to immerse myself in it in the words of those who were in fact slaves. I wanted to engage in the abolitionist movement. I wanted to see why it was that people at that particular time in bondage here in America turned to Jesus Christ. I wanted to hear it from them. And that exploration, which I had the privilege to do first when I was a seminarian at St. Tikhon's Orthodox Theological Seminary, uh, was, uh, was, was incredibly profound in my life. And, and certainly, I think, um, heavily influenced the direction that my life would take. That's fascinating. There's so many rabbit trails we could go down there. One I want to pick up on before we dive too deeply is that notion that when you joined the Orthodox Church and you fell in love with the liturgy and you encountered God there, you had this sense, not that you said anyone told you this, but you had this sense that somehow this was either at odds with your African-American heritage or at least somewhat like adjacent to it, like you just have to put that behind and adopt this new way of living or this new way of seeing the world. I'm curious, like, where do you think that came from? Like you said, it wasn't something that was explicit, but maybe like an implicit feeling. Is it from a lack of representation? Because I hear not necessarily this exact thing from many people, but I do hear people talking about this sense of like, if I became Orthodox, I'd need to become Greek or I'd need to become Russian. And like, I'm just not that. So what was it that kind of led you to this feeling, do you, at least um, in your own reflections? Yeah, Austin, that's a wonderful question. I, I actually think it is, it has so much to do with representation. And I remember how nervous I was really when I was going to seminary. I thought perhaps I would be the only person of color in my seminary. And, you know, the Lord has a way of, of uh, uh, easing our minds, easing our hearts. I remember when I was going into the monastery church at St. Tikhon's, beautiful, it's our first monastery in the lower 48, um, that, uh, that is a place where, where many go to for, for formation to be priests. And I remember going into the monastery church the very first day I was in seminary, and there was this icon of this black man with an afro. And I was so astonished when I saw it. And it was it was St. Moses the Black. And I, I know now that St. Moses was welcoming me into the church, that this was the Lord's way of saying, no, this is, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is, is diverse in his manifestation. And, and I think that that lack of representation was, uh, I think, where that really comes from. Now, the good news for me is, is, is that I see the Orthodox Church becoming increasingly actually diverse. When we look at the statistics around uh, the diversity of the Orthodox Church, it's, it's, uh, it's not incredibly diverse overall, but it is increasingly diverse. So we see this trend towards diversity, ethnic diversity, which is, uh, which is quite encouraging. And I, and I think that that's one of the reasons why, again, I wrote this book, because, I, uh, because we have to know, this my experience was that, again, what I had suspected was absolutely not true. And it was, uh, you know, coming into the church, I have never felt ostracized because of my ethnicity. Um, really, I, you know, in the church is where I have experienced this reconciliation, which, which is also something that I really tried to draw out of the African-American spiritual experience and, and talk about the role of the Orthodox Church in that, that we, that we have to have racial reconciliation and this really can only occur in Christ Jesus in its truest sense. And that has absolutely been my experience. This video is brought to you in part by Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is an organization of Christian counselors that exists to help you get the help you need. You can find them by going to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. And when you use that link, which you can find in the description down below, you will get 10% off your first month and they'll pair you up with a licensed mental health counselor in under 48 hours.
Once you've been paired up with a counselor, you can reach them via instant message, phone call, video call, and more. I think you will really enjoy this, and I think it could be the first step on your journey to greater mental health. And mental health problems affect all of us, religious, non-religious, old, young, every demographic feels the weight of mental health. But there are resources available, and you don't need to go through this alone, which is why I encourage you to reach out to the amazing people at Faithful Counseling by using that link, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity, and taking your first step towards healing and wholeness in your mental health. That's fascinating, and we'll certainly follow up on that here in just a second. One more kind of preliminary question before we get into some of these overlaps in the sense of fulfillment of African American spirituality in the Orthodox Church. Um, I think I'd be amiss to not just hit on St. Moses the Black here for those who are unfamiliar because they've heard St. Moses the Black in the name of your church. They've heard you talk about the, the fellowship of St. Moses the Black, and then you talk about this icon when you go into the monastery seeing Tikhons of St. Moses the Black. And if people aren't familiar, they might be going, okay, who is this guy? Which is a good inclination and they should go read more. But just maybe for someone who's completely unfamiliar, who is St. Moses the Black? Yes, St. Moses the Black uh, in the fourth century, he uh, is, an, is an African saint. He, he was a slave originally. He was so bad as a slave. He was so difficult as a slave that his owner actually got rid of him. And he would go into <clears throat> the deserts of Africa and actually raise a band of uh, bandits. And they, this gang, was they terrorized the countryside. I mean, they weren't just a gang. They were a brutal gang. He was he was what could arguably be said <clears throat> the most brutal uh, gang leader of his day. And they he one day stormed a monastery and punched through the door of the monastery um, with ill intention, confronted the abbot of the monastery, who would also go on to be a saint. And as it is in the account of St. Moses' life, the abbot was filled with such grace. He was filled with such grace that when St. Moses, when his eyes connected with the eyes of this abbot, St. Moses, he fell down on his knees in repentance for everything that he had done. And he begged the abbot to stay in the, in the monastery to embrace Jesus Christ. Uh, and the abbot accepted. And... Uh, Moses became a disciple of this abbot. Some time would pass, two men would crawl into St. Moses' room and try to rob him, ironically. And he ended up subduing the two of them, tied them up, and he drugged them to the abbot. And he said, these men tried to rob me. What would you have me do with them? And the abbot responded, teach them in the ways of Christ. And these two thieves became his first two disciples. And um, it is said in the account of his life that he had 72 men in his gang. And at the time of his death, it is said that he had 72 spiritual children that he had discipled. Uh, he ended up um, foreseeing his death, and choosing to uh, meet his death, actually by a rival gang that would, uh, that would catch him in the desert and execute him and six of his followers. They knew it was coming. They chose to give their lives as a witness of uh, Christ's love and redemption for mankind. There was a seventh monk who hid and recorded the event so that all the world would know um, how the great, uh, the great gang leader, Moses, would become the offering the sacrifice um, in this spirit of Christ's redemption. So it's quite a remarkable story, and he's he's been very um, he's meant a lot to us in our journey in Christ. And certainly, I think for for our community and the in the community that I serve, there are so many people who are uh, broken, who have regrets, and sometimes. It saddens me when people say, I have no regrets, because I think when we say that, we ignore the sins we have committed. I think every Christian should have regrets, and these regrets should lead to repentance. And I meet many people with regrets. And the good news is, is that we, you, we put up the example of St. Moses in his life, and we see 
what is possible in Christ Jesus our Lord. That with God all things are possible. That sinners become saints. That the gang leader becomes a spiritual father, a shepherd. You know, the wounder becomes the healer. Um, this is uh, this is quite powerful. It's been a powerful witness for us in our community, certainly. Wow, I'm so glad that I asked that question off the script here because that was such a fascinating story. I actually personally was not familiar with it, and so now I, I'd love to do a whole video on it because that was incredible, and I I can see why that would tie into your work so well, which I'm really excited to get to talk to about to you about here. So. You talk about this idea of the Orthodox Church being, in some sense, the fulfillment of African-American spirituality, and, and you hone in, like you talked about in your research, on African-American slave spirituality, at least in part, in the book. So I, I want to break down those two things a little bit as we get started here. So when we talk about African-American spirituality, what are we talking about? Because I imagine, I mean, we're, we're painting with a broad brush here, in a sense, but we might want to be careful to distinguish like what what we are saying maybe from what we're not saying there so african-american spirituality what do we mean by this term so this is a this is a fascinating question and um and so i would just say from a historical context it's it's clear to me in the research that there is consistency whenever i'm talking about african-american spirituality i really am talking about this in a historical context so we really look at the historical development of, of African-American spirituality. We see that um, there's a couple things we might say about it. Um, firstly, <clears throat> it is um, inherently Christian. So we see in the slave narratives, we see this overwhelming presence of Christianity or the Christian perspective. It is Christ-centered. That goes really across the wide demographic of the historical African-American experience. And you can see that really um, <clears throat> referenced in many ways, certainly among African-American leadership, certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, in the slave narratives. We can see that in the poetry and the spirituals. If we look even, for example, we say, well, what is the quintessential African-American folk music. So if we talk about music as a, a, you know, in different genres of music, we talk about, well, what is folk music? Uh, you know, American folk music, or what is the most American music? There are, there are, there are many who believe that the most American music, that is to say music that is really without, in, that has the least amount of influence from other lands is, the spirituals are the spirituals, these African-American, uh, you know, sacred music that is an expression of their faith. And if you really look at the music that dominated, you know, music is an expression of culture. And if you really look at the music that dominated the African-American experience in the antebellum era, it was indeed spirituals. And so really uh, these spirituals are an expression of uh, the this spiritual reality that they really lived in um, we would also say i would also say that from the research it's very important to understand that this spirituality historically again historically and in, in and now in the modern day some things are changing there's some reasons for that but historically there was there's this understanding of a mystical also reality of a mystical encounter so it is it is very important to, to understand that um <clears throat> in the antebellum era that that uh, slaves really uh they really believed that they would really come to their faith through a mystical encounter there's this uh, understanding of the mourner's bench when someone is going to come to uh, when someone comes into the church, someone wants to be a Christian, they're going to sit on the mourner's bench in repentance until, until they actually have this encounter with the Lord, at which point then they will be Christian. So there's this understanding that there's this mystical encounter. And there's some, um, and so I really, it was really fascinating to go through the, the slave narratives and really identify you know, what were some of these mystical encounters where, where people were saying, um, <clears throat> I'm not a Christian because, you know, my master has taught me to be a Christian. 
but rather uh, people become became Christians because God revealed himself. And it is, it is specifically Jesus Christ who revealed himself to these slaves. And so they um, also, I would say that, uh, that African-American spirituality is of the heart. It's one of the reasons why I chose this title for the book, The uh, Prayer of a Broken Heart, because, because really in their pain, uh, historically African-Americans, now again, I'm talking about in the antebellum era and, and since then, of course, but have really discovered their heart, the heart, the spiritual center of our humanity. Um, uh, when they discovered their heart, they, they really entered into the depth of their heart and they prayed in their heart. So this prayer of the heart was ever present among them. And it, it wasn't always loud and boastful and vocal, but it was deep, it was profound. It was ever present, and um, and and that is, uh, and you know, and also all of these things together, really, in my mind, present a unique expression of Christianity in America, in America. So when we look at other strands of Christianity in America, mainstream Christianity, I would argue that African American Christianity, as it developed is apart from that there's something different there's something that sets it apart from that and really what sets it apart is that it really developed in much the same conditions as the early church you know unlike mainstream christianity which was the uh which was the certainly the power you know the seat of power uh, through throughout much of american history african american Christianity really reflected the Christianity of the catacombs. This is where we look back, we see the first 300 years of Christianity where Christians had to practice their faith underground. The African-American experience was very similar to that, very similar to that, where we have accounts of slaves who were absolutely persecuted for, for, for uh, being found in prayer, for praying with, uh, without white supervision or praying at all. This, the, the laws that were passed that prohibited the baptism of African-Americans, and yet their love for Christ was so deep that they defied the laws and they risked that and they, and they practiced their faith. Their church emerged underground much like the, the early church. And so we see the spirituality uh, of these African-Americans, the Christian, distinctly Christian spirituality of these African-Americans reflecting in many ways the Christianity of the early persecuted church. And I think from those conditions and those origins, how that influenced the spirituality, the spiritual development uh, of, uh, uh, of these people um, speaks to why I see such synergy here i'm really intrigued there's a couple directions i want to take this and i'm going to hold maybe two of the other ones in my mind but the first one i want to ask is so i hear you painting this really interesting picture of the, the synergy as you said between the early church the church of the catacombs and with the early african-american church if, if we can even call it that right in the sense insofar as it often consisted as kind of a direct mystical experience with God and in a somewhat less than formalized structure, I imagine, due to the exigencies of the, the circumstances at the time. When I hear that description, right, uh, of this mystical encounter, this prayers without white supervision, this kind of like this spirituality of the catacombs in a way, I often hear that kind of conversation in the context of maybe some of my friends that are like into the house church movement or that are like really low church Protestant, like as low as you can go kind of thing. Um, because if the catacombs were good enough for the early church, then like my living room's good enough for us now kind of thing, right? And so I, I'm just, I'm curious to see how we take a different track here, right? Because often I hear people take that, that similar experience and they say, therefore, like no church hierarchy, no hierarchy at all, no formalization, like let's make the Eucharist like a community meal around my table, like all of that kind of thing. But you're pivoting from there to a different direction. And I, I want to maybe draw that out a bit and, and pull on that thread. So 
show me the the continuity there i mean i see it maybe in the mystical sense but but what would you say to the people who see that african-american spirituality that kind of um almost subversive might be too much but the idea of like praying without white supervision and doing this in kind of their own way how is that not lost when you put that into the structure of the orthodox church because I, I could imagine some people worrying that you might lose some of those distinctive african-american qualities when you become a part of this massive orthodox church could you talk about that a bit oh absolutely well so so firstly you know it's um, just in reference to the catacomb church when people talk about house churches, I, so I've been very privileged to, to to travel to the Middle East multiple times. And when you when you go to the Middle East, you you really get a different perspective on house churches. In fact, the oldest house church that we have um, that archaeologists have uncovered is, is called Dura Europa. Dura Europa. So it's the oldest house church that we have. In fact, whenever you you go to Dura Europa and you look at it and you say, well, okay, so this was a house church because um, you know, there was the persecution. They were unable to uh, pray in big churches or, or things like that. In fact, even when you go after Christianity was legalized after the fourth century, if you go to any of those churches, you will see um, in Syria, for example, uh, in Egypt, for example, you'll see the doors are very small. So you have to you have to squat down to get in. And it's not because people were super short. It's because they were always a they were always afraid that soldiers would be coming through those doors. So they so they made those doors small so that if a soldier couldn't come through on horseback, and also if if they did come through, they had to come through one at a time, and it took and it was very difficult for them to get to. So e so before that, so it wasn't a sense that when they were in the house that they were sitting around. In fact, what we know from archaeological evidence is that in the house they had in fact an altar. So they had they were serving liturgical services. It was it was the divine services, the liturgy, this the liturgy of St. James, which we still have in the Orthodox Church. We we practiced it was practiced in the houses. Whenever we started our ministry here in the Hill District, when we started to have liturgies here, we didn't have a big church. We had this little old shack it, you know, you could compare, it was, it was exactly like what those early house churches would have been. The only thing is we had an altar and we served the liturgy. And so we, and so there was, there was, it was in a house. It was liturgical at the same time. And we see even the Acts of the Apostles that they're, you know, they say we're praying at the sixth hour, you know, we're praying at the ninth hour. There's this liturgical aspect to their worship, to the worship of the apostles. So just to give some historical context in the early church and what really it was like. Now, if we come to the African-American experience, what's so fascinating is that it wasn't when, when this mystical encounter happened. Now, you, you might think that, that okay, so everybody's kind of like on this sort of, uh, you know, finding Jesus and it's sort of this free for all, et cetera, et cetera. Really, what I would say is, is that when people had this encounter, you know, these, these sort of these encounters with Christ, it inspired order among them. Now, this is a very fascinating thing because you would say, where would, uh, you know, who would be the leaders among these enslaved people? Okay, because, because they have no power in the world. They have no power in the world. The world is against them. The world has persecuted them. And yet among themselves, they found order and that order they understood to be divinely appointed so who would be the leaders among them it would be the preacher it would be the minister who would be the leaders among them it would be the one through whom the holy spirit spoke to them so it wasn't more loose than their experience in fact i would say that whenever they came into this faith and developed the spirituality, they ordered themselves more. And this order was very important. There's a certain uh, there's a certain degree of trust and rest that we find in order. There's a certain perspective that the Holy Spirit is going to speak uh, through others whom God has appointed to minister to us. And that was appreciated and understood uh, among African 
Americans. What I would say is, is, is that the reason why I think this pivot makes more sense is because um, uh, African Americans, it's, it's almost like, uh, you, you know, we don't say that, that they were doing this because they simply chose to do this. We would say that this was their reality because they were afforded no other opportunity. They were afforded no other opportunity. It's not to say that they chose this instead of some sort of, you know, liturgical practice. And in fact, there were there were many, uh, you know, many African American churches that would indeed have a, a more a, a liturgical approach. What we what we know though is is that this liturgical approach that, that when they ordered themselves, that as they create established these communities where really they had, uh, you know, the, when, even if we look at, for example, how they sang, there was an understanding about sacred music. You don't know, no, there were no instruments. There were no instruments that were permitted in worship at all. It was antif antiphonal, we would say, in the Orthodox Church, antiphonal singing, that these ones sing here and these ones sing here. It was not at all a free-for-all. There was this, there was this, uh, there was, in fact, you know, jazz music, jazz music, was you know the the black church was actually against jazz the black church was actually against jazz the reason being is because jazz was the antithesis of the order that they experienced in the church whenever they had spirituals they sang spirituals it was an expression of their order of their unity but jazz was everybody does you know this little riff and they found that spiritually dangerous so this is why Whenever we look at the Orthodox Church, the order that they experienced through their spirituality that was often attempted to be disrupted by the world is confirmed and affirmed in the Orthodox Church, just as it was in the Church of the Apostles, which was indeed ordered. I've, I've certainly found this, uh, found this to be true. And the final piece I would say is, is that, uh, you know, they're... they're um, the church is not just for one ethnic group. We coming into the church uh, have to be reconciled to one another. Neither Jew nor Greek, nor male nor female, nor slave nor free. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Coming into the order of the Holy Orthodox Church in that liturgy is where we become not African Americans, where we become, we become Christians. We become one in Christ. We become one with Christ and one with each other in Christ. And that is uh, extraordinarily important. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating answer. And I have to say, this is so fun for me to get to, to sit down and dialogue about this. And the way you were able to add so many different layers there from Dura to the antiphonal singing of the early African-American church. Uh, I, I could talk about this all day, but we don't have all day. So we're going to keep moving on this. But one thing that I want to circle back to, one of the things I had put a pin in on your earlier response is you talked about the African-American spirituality coming from this place of the heart. And specifically in your book title, you talk about a broken heart. And throughout the book, one of the main things that you highlight is the way that suffering has shaped the African-American church or African-American spirituality and how that's a key point of overlap with the Orthodox Church. Could you talk to me a bit about that? Absolutely. Um, you know, as Christians, we... We must find our heart. As Christians, we must know that the heart is the spiritual center of the human person. The Apostle Paul says we must pray without ceasing. Perhaps we wonder, how is it possible to pray without ceasing, to always be praying? To pray when we're awake, to pray when we're asleep, and even to have the Holy Spirit praying within us. When we talk about these things, we're talking about this mystery of the heart. We're talking about the prayer of the heart. Um, to discover our heart, it is often, it is often by pain that we discover our heart. People will talk about, I have a broken heart. People will say, uh, I'm suffering so. You know, one of our one of our saints gives this analogy of, uh, of a rich man who has all of the riches of the world, a grand palace. And yet, if his heart is broken, he stands in the midst of worldly riches and suffers. 
And I think most of us can relate to a broken heart. We've experienced some element of that broken heartedness at some point in our life. And that is the point in which we truly discover the spiritual center of our humanity. No one could tell us in that moment that that isn't real. Yet if we were to go to a hospital with all of our medical advances and have a CT scan or an MRI, they would discover nothing. And yet we know that it is true, that it is real. It is what we experience. When we experience a broken heart, we realize how frivolous the world is. We realize that the world is fleeting, that the things of the world pass away, that they rot and they rust and they disintegrate. We realize this of the world. But in our broken heartedness, um, is certainly in the uh, in the, uh, in, in, I would say from the perspective of uh, the Orthodox Church, from the Orthodox Christian perspective, brokenheartedness, is wherein we turn away from the world and towards the heavens. And when we think of prayer now as a vehicle to move the heart towards God, we understand prayer is the movement of the heart towards God not towards the world, but towards God, because we know in our brokenheartedness, in our pain, how fleeting this world truly is. And with this heavenwardly gaze, we practice repentance, understanding that in our repentance, we find by grace the healing of that brokenheartedness, where we have not just sorrow, but now we have sorrowful joy. That sense of sorrow is never truly gone for those of us in the world, but there is this profound sense of joy that that sorrow rests in. And that sorrowful joy defines the life of prayer. It defines the spiritual life, a life of repentance, a life of hope, a life in anticipation for a grace in healing, a mercy that is not of this world. Now, certainly that's an Orthodox Christian perspective. And I would say that from an African-American Christian perspective, the very same could be true. Um, brokenheartedness. Uh, this is a disease that has plagued African-Americans from the beginning of our time in the Western Hemisphere. Brokenheartedness. It's not just a historical reality, it's present now among us. I spend my days among men and women and children who are brokenhearted, not just because of one tragedy, but because of many that besets them and their families and their social networks. And I will tell you that when we pray with the brokenhearted, it is, uh, it is powerful. Their prayers move mountains. Their prayers cast out demons. Their prayers heal the sick. Their prayers turn the wicked to repentance. And I've seen it many times. So the brokenhearted prayer, as it says in Psalm, we would say Psalm 50, Psalm 51, in the Western tradition, a broken and humble heart God will not despise. There's a great power here. And I think this is why uh, I discovered counts of slave owners who were terrified of the prayers of their slaves. Uh, this is why I believe, I believe, this is why they did not permit slaves to pray because they knew. They knew what power was to be found in the prayer of a broken heart. Sadly, what they did not realize is, is that those broken hearted prayers in the accounts that I have seen were not prayers for vengeance, but prayers for peace, prayers for freedom, 
prayers for reconciliation, prayers for forgiveness. And so I think that there is profound lesson to be found uh, when we see this brokenheartedness in the prayer it inspires uh, coming together uh, with the Orthodox Church and the African American Christian experience to edify, to edify those of us who are follow followers of Jesus Christ who might like these traditions reject the world repent for our sins look forward in anticipation for the hope of the world to come and rest in the peace in the joy of our lord that is not of this world amen that was that was beautiful father paul thank you for that and thank you for the the way you you dive into that idea of the, the sorrowful joy of prayer that that really spoke to me and I, I believe that's going to speak to a lot of people who are listening so i i appreciate that so much not to bring it down too much but but i think it's essential to to ask this question or or to address it in a conversation such as this is that you and it's something you talk about in your book that there have been people and there are certainly today who, who look at the, the broken heart uh, of the African American experience in the US like over throughout history and would say that so much of that broken heartedness came through people who also claimed to be following Jesus that, that so much of that pain came at the hands of people who who not only claimed to be following Jesus but but claimed to be doing what they were doing with with the backing of scripture and that's caused people to turn from the church thinking that the the answer is elsewhere and you, you talk about things like the nation of islam or different different movements that that sought to to kind of pivot away from the church find hope outside of it because it seemed as though that christianity might be part of the problem rather than the solution now i think you've talked very eloquently about how the idea of christianity just being the white man's religion isn't historically accurate right that, that there is this this fundamentally christian um identity at the heart of african-american spirituality historically speaking but to those who either historically or today look at the the suffering of african-americans in this country and see it so often coming at the hands of people claiming the title christian what, what do you say to people who experience that pain and say why should i look for hope in the church does that make sense Yes, absolutely. And I truly appreciate that question. And I would say that um, it's a complex answer. Uh, on the one hand, it, it's, it's undeniable that there, were, that there were Christians who were absolutely uh, complicit in the slave trade. They were complicit in the, uh, you, you know, in the, uh, you know, in being slave owners uh, in, in America, in the slave institute, excuse me, the institution of slavery in America. Um, uh, people, the Christians who were complicit in Jim Crow and, and certainly trying to use scripture to justify that. What I would say, however, is that, again, historically speaking, if really we look at uh, the role of Christianity as it relates to the oppression of African Americans, uh, for me, it's absolutely undeniable that Christianity is actually the driving force in the causes of justice and reconciliation all throughout African American history. In fact, whenever you look at, whenever you look at the, even if we go back to the whole conversation around, uh, will, can, will slavery be able to continue um, at the Second Continental Congress? Will slavery be able to continue as in this new country, this free country, 1789? We see that that there were that really the opposing voice of slavery came from. Christians, if we look at the Underground Railroad, it's all uh, run by Christians. If we see that the, the slave owners, we look at uh, slave owners and we see how, you know, what was their real disposition, we see that they, many of them, they were themselves, many not religious. There were religious slave owners, and, and certainly, as I think I even mentioned in my book, that, that, that there were slaves that found that religious slave owners tended to be the worst kinds of slave owners, the toughest uh, slave owners, really most of the time, these slave owners, they themselves were not 
religious. It's important to understand that that really whenever we get into it, there are that 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 it's not just about it's not just about uh, that people weren't really in, uh, enforcing slavery. They weren't doing Jim Crow because they had this deep, profound spiritual life. In fact, it's just quite the opposite. What we really see in their accounts is that they're, they, they were people of ardent hearts who really despised religion. They might have gone along with it. They might have gone to church to keep uh, uh, you know, a particular uh, social order, but actually many of them did not. If you ever read the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, it's, it very clearly portrays this reality. And Harriet Beecher Stowe, she, uh, she was very careful in how she wrote that book. And in fact, wrote that book based off of real experiences. So whenever you read that, you're like, it's a fictional story, it is. It's based on real experiences. And what you see so consistently is that these slave owners were not religious people. And what you see consistently is the theme in Uncle Tom's cabin is that those who were Christians, whether they were in the North or whether they were in the South, always understood that slavery was against the will of God. They understood it. And we see that Christianity, as she portrays it in that book, is the driving oppositional force to the evil of slavery. It's, it's just very clear. So I think we have to have that historical context uh, we have to have an accurate understanding, reflection of this. I think sometimes we assume too much. Now, now Frederick Douglass, he he talked about he talked about that that there was a difference between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Jesus Christ. So he made a distinction between the two because he said the Christianity of America uh, is is you know it is not true Christianity because because it has made space for slavery to exist here and I think that's also very consistent that 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 we will see we will see uh, that, that we will see people who you know like attempt to hijack Christianity in order to fulfill political objectives and when they do that it is no longer true Christianity. Um, you know, we, we might refer, I might refer to the scriptures here and say, look, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised because the scriptures themselves say that, 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 the, that Satan himself appeared as an angel of light. So therefore, do not be surprised when his ministers also appear as ministers of righteousness. Of course, we know that the evil one is going to mock Christianity by attempting to use Christian, presenting to present himself, to present himself with the cloak of Christianity. But see, what I would say is if, if our, I'm talking about now my, if my ancestors, if my ancestors who were living in bondage, if my ancestors who were present among that hypocrisy, if my ancestors who knew that the Christianity of this land was not truly the Christianity of Jesus Christ. If they knew all of that and still loved Christ with all of their heart, all of their mind, all of their soul, all of their being, I would say that, that is more powerful than the hypocrisy of those who claim to be Christian but fail to be so in practice. I choose rather to focus not on the hypocrisy of the sinner, but the sanctity of the saints. Because there, whenever we put our focus there and we receive what they have handed down to us, which was forged through hours and lifetimes of unimaginable suffering, we will receive something extraordinary for our salvation if we choose rather to focus on those who attempted to pervert the gospel for their own selfish ends then there's too much of a temptation to mimic the very sins that they have committed against christ so i think that the final word I would say on this, and this is what 
uh, <clears throat> is absolutely hard for people to understand, I think, in 21st century America. And I've often said this, and people, they have say, they've asked me, Father, are there racists in the church? And I always respond to them, I hope so. Because how else will they be healed from the sin of racism? The church is a hospital. And I know that people aren't going to be saints before they come into the church. I always tell people that Christ's church is a come as you are church. It's just not a stay as you are church. So we mustn't ever give up on the racists among us. We pray that one day we stand with them in the kingdom of God, not as enemies, but as brothers and sisters. This is the way of our God. It is contrary to the ways of the world. And it is perhaps hard for us to hear. But this is divine truth. And this truly is the experience of my ancestors. Wow. I thank you so much for that. That was fantastic. And I, I could continue this conversation for so long, but I'm not sure I can think of a better place to, to wrap it up than with that, uh, with that, that picture uh, of what reconciliation looks like, the, the messiness of that, that, that answer of, are there racists in the church and saying, I hope so, because this is where they will experience transformation that it's come as you are but not stay as you are that that is such a a compelling picture to me of what the church can and should be and i think that people will just absolutely love getting to dive into more of what you have to say on this in your book which i'll be linking down below but father paul thank you so much for your time today this has been an absolute pleasure and a privilege for me i i wrap up all of my episodes with what I call kind of the final four, which are an opportunity to kind of get to know the guests a little bit more on a personal level. Um, so, so we're going to transition to that now, but I just want to say thanks again for that. This was such, such a pleasure for me. I'm, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. And, and there's so much more, again, if people want to check out in your book about the overlaps between the Orthodox Church and African-American spirituality that we weren't able to dive into today, but is absolutely worth uh, the, the price of the book. So people will enjoy that. But the first question for you here is, what has been the most fruitful habit or spiritual discipline in your life? Oh, I, I, would, I would say, honestly, uh, morning prayer, morning prayer. Um, you, know, you know, for me, uh, uh, prayer in the morning, you know, it's like some people who are coffee drinkers, they're like, I can't imagine a day without coffee. Like, you know, so, you know um, that's what prayer <clears throat> in the morning is for, is for me. And, and uh, and that that always just being able to, to to really set my day to you know to really commune with God to to uh, to receive grace you know to to you know to pray for wisdom to ask the Holy Spirit to fill and guide me and speak through me and move through me asking the Lord to flood my heart with love for all those that I will encounter this day this and and of course you know with that um, you know the scriptures and spiritual readings that that morning you know that morning prayer reflection is is. Uh, very, very precious to me. I love it. Outside of the Bible, what has been the most impactful book on your life? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I, uh, boy, that, that's, that's such a difficult question. <laughs> such a difficult question. Um, so I don't know if this is the, I don't, I, I, um, gosh, I don't know if this is a, this is the best answer or even the most impactful book, but the one, one that comes to mind is uh, being as communion, John mm. uh, John D. Ziziolis, and and I think that's a you know it's a powerful book because it it's I think in the human experience this idea that that you know we create in the image and likeness of God are relational and and that we fulfill our being in communion you know and and how that's even impacted my ministry. People say, how did you learn how to do trauma informed human development? And I say, what's the you know it's the Eucharist actually. <laughs> and people are like, I love what? it. You know? <laughs> I love it. You know, that book's been on my reading list for a bit and I will bump it up now with that recommendation. Oh, All right. So 
you've gone back in time, hypothetically, right? And you're getting coffee with yourself right before entering seminary. What <laughs> advice do you give him for his future in ministry? Ah, uh, yes. So, so the advice I would give myself is um, don't worry about how you will do it. Just give your whole self to preparation. Uh, that would be the advice. Because I think sometimes, it, you know, we, we confuse, we, we just want to work on the how, the details of the how, but we reflect, but we neglect how important it is to just prepare in our own personal way that God will take care of the how. So our work is to prepare, uh, pr learn to pray, read the scriptures, spend time with holy people. Um, edify yourself now so that when it comes time to do uh, you can be the right vessel for God's work wonderful the last question that I like to ask all of my guests and it's a real privilege for me is you know the the title of this show is gospel simplicity and I'm often told that sometimes the conversations are a bit complex so I like to end it here <laughs> in a sentence or so what is the gospel hmm. The gospel is the good news that God is with us, that all the world is loved, and that the heavens are open to us. Hmm. I love that. I love that. I usually would wrap up right here, but just to give you one opportunity, um, we didn't get to talk about it today, but if people are anything like me and they, they got to sit and listen to this conversation, they're just fascinated by what you have to say, and the book is just the start of their fascination, they want to learn more, could you let people know how they can learn about what you're doing with the Neighborhood Resilience Project? Thank you. So neighborhoodresilience.org, neighborhoodresilience.org, that's the website. Certainly you can like us on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, also follow us. Um, yes, please look into our work, uh, look into our ministry. Um, it's been very, uh, it's been very profound in my life. And, uh, and uh, certainly we look forward to uh, inviting others into it as well. I love that. I've got lots of family up in the Pittsburgh area. So uh, perhaps I'll, I'll definitely be looking into this more. Thank you so much. I'll link the book and the Neighborhood Resilience Project down below. It's, it seems like such fantastic work you're doing. And I'm so grateful that your voice is out there, not just speaking about these things, but you're out in the communities doing things. So thank you for your work, for your voice and for your faithfulness, Father Paul. I'll end as I always do by saying until next time, be on the lookout for more videos, but far more importantly than that, go out and love God and love others because truly above all else, that will change the world.